orders of nature, all sorts. Uh, I was talking before about reduc reductionism, and if, if, when you look through the history of philosophy and the history of uh, other disciplines as well, there has been tendencies to try to argue some of these away, you know, to, to reduce the mental to the material, uh, or the fictional to the material, or the changing to the stable, or the stable to the changing. I mean, when you read classical Greek philosophers, for example, some of them say, our entities and some others present, the only thing that's real is the stable, and this is all kind of illusory. Or, the other way around. Heraclitus is famous for saying you can't step twice into the same river. Why not? Because from his point of view, reality really is changing. Stability is the, is the illusion. Well, the view I'm trying to articulate here is that we don't have to make those judgments. We don't have to argue anything away. Because we do have a way of understanding nature and experience that allows us to take seriously all of these things. So nature consists of these innumerable orders. You don't, need a, you don't need a reality list. Reality is sort of whatever there is and whatever we encounter. But this is the rough then, that all the orders are equally real. All of them. So we don't have to do what we have traditionally done and many disciplines still do. It says that this one's really real, that one's not so real, this one's real, that one's illusory, this one exists, that one doesn't exist. No. Nature has whatever orders it has and they're all uh, equally real, which allows us to do a number of things and allows us to approach uh, issues in interesting ways. Okay, so the next is an entity may have different traits and different orders of relations. So, this is, this is where it starts to get interesting, I think. So, for example, um, in the order of Euclidean geometry, parallel lines remain parallel to infinity. Did I get that right? No. Correct. Well, you think geometry, two lines are parallel against the third line follows the corner, and the internal angles of the same side are two right, two right. Are able to two right? Okay. Yeah. And on a plane, okay. And on a plane, do, do, uh, do, Parallel lines remain parallel? Yeah, same thing in non degree yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's all right. Uh, because the, the contrast I want to make is that, uh, so in, in those mathematical orders, Euclidean and other kinds of geometry, parallel lines remain parallel. In the order of vision, they converge. They converge at the horizon. In the visual order, they do. So you got that. I told you this is where it gets interesting. Yeah. Stand up, stand on a, stand on the train tracks and look straight ahead. And in the visual order, in the order of relations that is your visual field, those rails converge. Okay? Yes. Now, the question is, see, traditionally, Fossils wanted to do to say what you just said. I oh, know, wait a minute. You know, one of those is real and the other is a, an illusion or an appearance. Right? Okay. But what I just said before is that all of these orders are equally real. So, it, so the visual order is as real as any other order. In that order, the tracks converge at the horizon. Not in the order of you know, plane geometry, maybe a bit better way to talk about it. There they don't. Um, and that turns out to be important because if we don't allow that observation, then we must do what traditionally has been done which is to say, well, this one is illusory, that one isn't. And then we create all kinds of problems. Among other things, we create, if we said that the visual order is an appearance as opposed to real, you know, in the real order, parallel lines remain parallel to infinity, and the visual order that they don't indicates that this is somehow not real, then we have a fundamental problem of trying to establish the relation between the visual order, which we've just said is, is the one in which we live, by the way, and, and, and what we just said is not real, the relation of that to what we've decided is real. Well, it turns out that you know, philosophers and others have been trying to articulate that relation for a couple thousand years and have failed. They've failed. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, there have been a lot of attempts, 
but uh, none of them have been satisfactory. Well, one way to avoid this problem is, I call this the Humpty Dumpty fallacy. I don't know if you know it. It was Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Well, this, this is the problem we have in a lot of intellectual work. We fractured our world, and then we set about trying to glue it back together, and often unsuccessful, usually unsuccessful. Well, we have a way of understanding our own world that doesn't push up the off the wall in the first place. In other words, it doesn't fracture everything. The fact is, we get along fine understanding that in a visual order, parallel lines converge at the horizon, and in other orders, like mathematical orders, they don't. It doesn't fit problems, but we need a, a philosophical way to understand it. Okay, there are other examples. So, for example, um, there was a, uh, I think it was Arthur Eddington, physicist, astronomer, 100 years ago, so famously said that, you know, physical, I could, I could have it wrong about who said this, but it was somebody like that, said, the table is nothing but uh, very small, empty space, mostly empty space, with a lot of very small, small particles whizzing around at great speeds. But we know what you meant. And in the order of the particle physics, maybe, or, or what, what, however we want to describe the order which he did, in which he's offered that description, I'm sure he's right. In the order of serving dinner, he's not right. And the reason I know that is I can put my plate on the table. And I can sit down and I can eat my dinner and it's not falling through the empty space with anything missing around. In that order. In the order of social relations, in, in Soviet times, for example, in the Soviet Union, one of the safest places, you can, the one place you can sit and talk with your friends and say anything you want is the kitchen table. In that order of relations, table is much more than empty space with a bunch of particles moving around at high speeds. So it's not going to be more, it's much else. So the point is that to honor, in a way, to recognize our experience, we need to be able to say that in various orders of relations, things have various traits, and we don't need to reduce one to the other. This is why it was Edgerton who said that he's right in the description, but solidly he's wrong to say that it's just or nothing but this. It's a lot more than empty space with particle was uh, Okay, and this is sort of the last point that's worth making. That in this uh, general conception, there is no order of nature. There's no big, one big system, it turns out. There are technical reasons why there can't be one big system on, on this, this set of ideas. If there were one big system, it would have no there'd be no order of relations in which to locate it. And if there were no order of relations in which to locate it, there'd be no way for it to have a character and identity. Uh, so it turns out that nature is not to be understood um, as, as one big thing of any kind. Uh, it is innumerable orders, innumerable sets of relations related to one another in various ways. And our experience sort of depicts uh, this is actually the world view stuff. I don't, I don't think we need to go through this because I, I went through it rather quickly. But it's just to point out that in all of these fields, or many of them, we very much still uh, take a non-relational view. And once we articulate a relational conception of things, and then take those ideas and start examining um, political theory or international relations theory or some of these others, uh, we, we find that the, the implications are rather serious. I mean, just to give you one example, if, if we, when you look at the, 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 the international relations uh, field, the discipline of international relations, the, the theories uh, of international relations all operate with the assumption that uh, nation states have their are, are individual entities, each with their own national interest, as in that case, you know, in, 
Smith in economic interests, individual interests in, in international relations theories, national interests, and then they enter into relations with one another, like the billion balls on the table, in a kind of what, you know, what Hobbes or Locke called a state of nature. It's like, it's like uh, Newton's boy. And then they, then they enter, and, how, and then the question is, you know, how do you keep them from blowing up? Well, sometimes you don't, and there's wars. And, but uh, the, the, the enterprise of foreign policy then on this assumption is to figure out how to advance the interests of yours in this state of nature set of relations with others. But it's a very baroque picture. Not surprisingly, because the nation state had its origins, actually, out of the Treaty of Westphalia, which ended the Thirty Years' War in Central Europe in 1648. This is when Hobbes is writing. Locke writes soon after this, based on Hobbes and much of this experience. So the, the modern nation state comes out of this period, and the categories and terms in which we understand it still are rooted in this time and place. And if you, so if you change the picture, and you say, you know, nation states, like anything else, are constituted by their relations, then for one thing, it doesn't even make sense to talk about national interests, at least not in a traditional way, because, because the character of a nation state is going to be a function of its relations. It doesn't, pre, it's not predetermined before the relations, it's a function of the relations. And that changes how we can expect states to interact with one another. It would change foreign policy considerably, or how we conduct foreign policy, if we take make this shift in our opinion. So there are implications like this. I say music in the end because it's worth pointing out that even some of the basic principles of Baroque music, <coughs> Bach as the primary example, uh, express some of the same, roughly the same idea. I mean, if you, when you study uh, music theory, uh, composition, you'll study, uh, I assume you still do this in music schools, you'll study Baroque counterpoint. And Baroque counterpoint, the principles of Baroque counterpoint is that um, is that there are uh, melodic lines, two, three, four, depends on how clever you are, how, how, how complex you want to make it, two, three, 